So I imagine people will still continue to trickle in, but maybe we'll get started for now. Uh, so welcome again, officially. Uh, my name is Kazu Haga. I'm a core member of the East Point Peace Academy. And I usually live um, on Ololing land in the Bay Area, but I'm currently in Taiwan in uh, New Taipei City, uh, where we're getting ready to celebrate Lunar New Year. So happy Lunar New Year's to you all. And uh, yeah, this is really exciting for me. Um, I was just sharing with some of the panelists um, before people started to come on that I woke up in the middle of the night last night and I couldn't go back to sleep. And so I was just thinking about the gift economy and how when the gift economy was introduced to me when, I, when we were starting East Point, it was just a thing that we did to make our workshops as financially accessible as possible. Um, but in the last nine years or so since then, how it's just completely transformed my life and transformed the ways that I look at relationship and resources and value and connections and all of that. Um, so it's really going to be fun to spend a little bit of time hearing from other people and their experience with the gift and just deepen in this discussion with you all. And you'll be hearing from three amazing folks and I'll be introducing them to you in a little bit. But we actually want to jump right into uh, a couple minutes in small groups just to give you all some time to connect with each other. And so in a few seconds, we'll be putting you into small groups for about six minutes or so, seven minutes. And we want you to respond to the prompt. Um, we'll just uh, share your name, your pronoun, and where you're calling from. And then responding to the prompt, what is a gift that you have either given or you have received recently? And when I say gift, huh? that can mean many, many different things, right? A gift could be a physical gift, um, but it could be something that's not physical <laughs> at all. So what is a gift that you have either received or um, given recently? Um, and again, that can mean anything. And you'll have a few minutes to share in small groups of three or four for about six or seven minutes, okay? Um, and then we'll come back and jump. Um, but thank you all for engaging in the small group discussions. And uh, we want to jump into it now and, and hear uh, some people's experiences about the gift economy and how they've been experimenting it with it in their work and their own personal lives. Um, I'm also really excited because I've been in the experiment for a few years, but really just in the context of East Point. Um, and so to have an opportunity to hear from different organizations, individuals, communities, um, experimenting with this is going to be really fun. And so uh, really excited to introduce the first person. I think it makes a lot of sense that um, this person will be the first person that we're introducing because um, Cassandra Shaler is the development director at the East Bay Meditation Center. And the East Bay Meditation Center, um, who some of you may know, they're known as the most diverse meditation center in the world. Um, and they're actually the community who I learned the gift economy from. Um, there's a particular person named David Folke who did a lot of thinking around the gift economy. And he was the first person that really taught me the gift economy. Um, before East Point first started, all of the workshops we were running was held with, uh, for no charge at East Bay Meditation Center. And so I've really learned a lot from them. Um, but I've, as I've gotten to know Cassandra, just through organizing this event, um, really realized how much more we have in common than just the East Bay Meditation Center and just um, uh, our connection with the gift economy and just really learning her long roots in, in issues that I really care about. She's also the co-founder and former director of Justice Now. And as I found out, co-founder of Critical Resistance, which had a huge impact on me in my kind of coming of age as a young activist and is also um, the mom of a young, beautiful child. And so we're uh, excited to welcome Cassandra and let me uh, look for her and spotlight her so you all can see. And yeah, so Cassandra, welcome. And uh, yeah, love to hear some of your thoughts. So much. Um, thanks Kazu for inviting me to be part of the conversation today. I'm really honored to be on the panel and um, so um, excited to see people gathering from all over the country. I, 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 I guess when we were talking about the, um, you know, putting this together, it didn't, I don't know why it didn't register with me that, that, that there would be such a wide range of um, people coming in from different geographic locations, which is really exciting. And like you said, so much a part of what Zoom has engendered and created. And 
um, at the East Bay Meditation Center, we also have experienced that um, because we moved all of our offerings online in March of 2020. And so now have people joining from all over the country and other parts of the world. So I wanna issue that invitation to anybody who's on this call to um, join us um, on Zoom for now. Um, so yeah, I wanted to say a little bit in response to um, some questions that Kazu sent as sort of prompts for us as panelists to to say a little bit about how the gift economy came into our lives and how we use it. And um, Kazu just mentioned um, that, you know, I, I come to the work that I do now at the East Bay Meditation Center through anti-prison and prison abolition work in the late 1990s and 2000s, which it's hard to think now about how much time that is, but, um, I was part of a formation called Critical Resistance and an organization called Justice Now, where I was working with people in women's prisons in California. And we were um, supporting organizing inside and trying to get people out and collaborating with people inside on a campaign called Building a World Without Prisons. Um, and though I wasn't thinking about it um, as gift economics at the time, in response to Kazu's um, prompt, I was reflecting on that work and um, thinking about the generosity and the reciprocity that was part of it. And um, thinking of an example um, that um, feels salient to this conversation. And so the, the support that we were offering from Justice Now was offered freely with no expectation of financial compensation. Um, but at one point, people inside launched a stamp campaign, um, which was a, a campaign that grew organically from the inside to for um, folks to gather postage stamps and send them into Justice Now, which if you have been in prison or are connected to people inside, um, you know that stamps hold great value, um, in part because they have a practical function and a monetary value. And for people who at that time were making less than a dollar an hour um, is actually a substantial monetary value. Um, but they also hold a really significant symbolic value because they represent the ability um, for people to connect from the inside to the outside world. So, um, so that was a really deeply meaningful gift for those folks. And they contributed hundreds of stamps each year in the stamp drive that they launched. And, um, you know, and in that instance, also people were giving to support the larger effort um, and the long-term goal of the work and not necessarily to help themselves, but to help other people. Um, so for me, that really resonated in thinking about it as like an expression of what we're talking about today, this, this idea of giving freely with no expectation of something in return. Um, and, and also made me think about one of the principles that we talk about at EBMC, at the East Bay Meditation Center, when we're talking about gift economics, which is inclusivity, that idea of including everyone in the system of gift economics and not assuming that because people have limited financial resources that that means people don't have a meaningful contribution to make. Um, and um, then as now at EBMC, there was an element of um, transparency that was really important and sort of part of the, um, the, the origin of that practice um, with the stamp campaign. Um, transparency and accountability because we had people inside who were part of our board, our board of directors at Justice Now, um, who knew what was needed to continue to run the program because they were seeing the budgets and the program plans. And so they organized the stamp drive to help meet that need. Um, and I was also thinking about the connection between the current turn or return to the gift economy if we acknowledge the ways in which it's also an ancient practice um, to abolitionist practice. That as abolitionists, we think not only about dismantling systems of oppression, um, but also about 
changing, transforming, creating everything we need for everyone to be free, to thrive, to live healthy, happy, fulfilling lives. Um, so abolition calls for an end to systems of punishment and simultaneously asks, you know, how do we create systems of mutual aid? How do we care for each other? Um, so for me, the gift economy is an expression of that, an important part of the world we're creating now, now and for the future. Um, so there are those through lines, um, you know, in my work as an activist in abolitionist circles for the last 25 years. Wow, that's really odd. And also as a Sangha that's member. And to attack him. I can hear someone who's not muted. I think. Um, and uh, a staff person at EBMC for the last 10 years, which as Ka Kazu said, has been a leader in explicitly um, relying on a gift economics model from its inception. And the thing that I wanna, and I know we'll talk more as we go along, so I don't wanna take up too much time, but just to say, um, you know, that, that EBMC exists really powerfully at the intersection of dana, which is the practice of generous giving in, in Buddhist practice, um, which is said to be, um, the practice of generous giving is said to be the first teaching of the Buddha. Um, that at that intersection of dana and social justice. Um, and so that our shaping of the practice of gift economics at EBMC is because we're um, kind of meeting in, in th at that place. Um, and because it's about reciprocity and about everyone being invited to be part of it and everyone's gift is equally valued um, the gift economic system, you know, serves to break down hierarchies um, and systems of domination that are inherent in racial capitalism, in white supremacy, in heteropatriarchy, in all of these systems that, um, as you know, social justice activists, we are trying to um, shift. So. Yeah, all of that is to say, I, I feel incredibly grateful for the opportunity to spend so much time dwelling in gift economics as a practice um, at EBMC and in my, you know, broader work as an activist. And I'm really, um, yeah, it feels like a really, um, like a moment of so much opening and so much possibility now in in, in the world in this moment in time. And I'm, I'm very excited to hear from other folks about how they're, um, how they're using the gift um, in their work and in their lives too. So thanks so much for, for the opportunity to be part of it. And I'll pass it over to Kazu or pass it back. Thank you so much, Cassandra, for that. Um, and yeah, really appreciating the connections that you're making with abolition. Um, and, and the gift economy and, and all of the, the wisdom that comes from Buddhist practice as well. So thank you and look forward to hearing more from you. And uh, yeah, we'll transition a little bit now um, to hearing from our next uh, speaker who is Praniti, who um, there's another organization that many people may be familiar with called Service Space. And they're another place that has done lots and lots of experiments on generosity and the gift economy. And so I was like, oh, I should reach out to Service Space and, and, and see who they might uh, want to have on the panel. And without hesitation, they're like, oh, you need to talk to this person, Praniti, who runs an amazing yoga studio um, in Los Angeles. Um, but, you know, as also I've gotten to know her a little bit through this process and have found out that she's also uh, uh, an activist that has really strong value systems, not only around the gift economy, but making sure that there's access to healing modalities for many people in her community, also a musician. Um, and also, I think in a similar way to Cassandra, uh, her identity as the mother of two children is probably her most important way that she uh, identifies. So we're very grateful to have Praniti on the call and to hear from her. So let me spotlight her and uh, yeah, take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Kazu, for this opportunity. Um, I feel like I'm already learning a lot. Thank you for your sharing, Cassandra, um, as well. So yeah, I um, was connected to Service Space about mm, 
seven, eight years ago or so, uh, right when I was about to start my yoga shala. My yoga shala here in Los Angeles is called Yoga Shala West. And um, I had spent uh, many years here in the LA yoga scene, and it really is a yoga scene here. It's, it's you know, if any of you are familiar with uh, Southern California, it's like being an actress and being a yoga teacher is like pretty much the same thing. <laughs> um, anyway, I was practicing, I was teaching around at different studios and I was seeing how commercial yoga had become here. Um, it was rare to walk into a, a, a practice space and not see the shop or the boutique be like the first thing that you see, you know, people trying to just um, to make a buck, it seemed like to me. Um, but I also know the reality of running a space. So I understand that we need, you know, we need, the, we need the money to keep it going. Anyway, I wanted to offer something different because I felt like the practice, specifically the, the form of yoga that I practice and that I offer was out of reach for a huge amount of people. Um, I felt the practice becoming more and more elitist. And I'm in the fortunate position of having some financial support uh, and so I thought, well, if I'm going to open a space, I want it to be my primary mission. I want to be to make the practice accessible for as many people as possible. And uh, around that time, which was in 2015 that I opened, I was getting more connected with service space and learning about the gift economy, different ways of running organizations. And um, I was really fortunate to have this group called Laddership. Uh, at service space to bounce ideas off of and kind of come up with a fee structure that felt inclusive and accessible. Um, and so we opened our doors in 2015 with, uh, with what we call like a flexible fee structure. We have a suggested range for a monthly contribution, um, but if people are not able to meet the minimum that we offer as our range, they're welcome to contribute whatever is sustainable for them. We also have students that contribute above the suggested range if, if that's within their means. Um, and it was a huge experiment when we started in 2015. My goal was to uh, just break even and, uh, and we did. And that was actually a huge surprise. Um, and there were a lot of ways that we did that. So we, of course, welcomed everyone's varying contribution levels, but we were also really clear that in order to make it work, we needed to keep our costs as low as possible. And so we rent, um, we rent a teeny tiny space and we don't have any front desk staff. So we, I basically run all the admin. Um, we have community members that help us with cleaning. You know, it's, it's really a team effort. Um, uh, and yeah, it, it's been amazing, like Kazu had mentioned, to watch the contributions that come in that are outside the financial, you know, people, it, it was just a really wonderful surprise that people, when they feel, they feel like they're part of something, um, the, the ways in which they contribute, people leaving fruits or treats on the front desk or getting hooked up with each other, we actually just celebrated our first um, Shala marriage, two students just got married. <laughs> we have uh, had people start living with each other, working for each other. So just like this intermingling of relationships that happens when, when people are able to contribute freely outside of the, uh, you know, outside of the traditional economy. Now, all that being said, it's been an amazing ride and then the pandemic happened. And I wanted to address this a little bit here because um, when we talk of, I've had this experience when we talk about gift economy and these, these principles of generosity that we sometimes want to skirt around the edges and not talk about the really challenging stuff. And so I just wanted to invite that into this conversation as well. Um, once the pandemic happened, you know, we are, um, you know, we're an in-person practice space. So we obviously had to shift everything online. And for a while, people stuck around, but as the months went on and on, uh, of course, you know, some people were not able to contribute financially, some people moved, some people stopped practicing, and so our contributions fell quite a bit. And yet, uh, we still had our space, so I was still paying rent, and um, it got really challenging. And uh, we were closed a total of about 14 months. We came back in uh, spring of 2021 to in-person practice. We had severely limited capacity though, because we were following all the local ordinances. 
Um, and slowly we're bringing ourselves out of it. But it's been really interesting for me to just kind of observe myself. And um, as the finances have gotten tighter and tighter, it's been a real practice to, to stick with our mission, you know, to, to kind of breathe into the tightness and find room for expansion and adjust expectations. And um, yeah, it's, it's just been really interesting. And um, I've also noticed that there's been a real shift in our community. We had spent pre-pandemic about five years building this web of relationships. Um, and then during the pandemic, uh, a lot of those relationships fell away, like I said, because of moving or job changes or whatever. And we have almost a whole new set of students now practicing with us. So it's really interesting to try and rebuild relationships, or rather, I should say, forge new relationships within um, our, you know, the structure that we have at the Shala, um, but not have this expectation of what it was or what it used to be, and just allow the room to grow and to see what's coming next for our community. Um, yeah, and I just also wanted to speak on a personal level. I feel like one of the beautiful things about trying to run an organization inspired by the gift economy um, is, is the internal work it requires for the person that's in the position of space holder or whatever title, um, you know, we want to call it. Um, one of the things that I often have to check myself with is that, you know, because I'm probably the only one at the show who's aware of which person is contributing what, and I'm also the teacher, so I really have to be transparent and honest with myself about how I'm treating each student and make sure I am being as generous with my spirit as I can, regardless of what I'm receiving financially from that student, you know? And um, yeah, again, I just wanted to, wanted to bring that up because it's an edge. And I think we have to be really honest with ourselves when we're running organizations in this way about these edges because they're the places that, um, that we sort of need to lean into, you know, to, to continue to expand. Um, and I'll just close with uh, something that I, that came to me when actually you offered the first prompt Kazu, which is, you know, what does generosity mean to you? And I had this image of a kind of a heart that feels a little tight. And for me, I think generosity is when you feel the heart becoming tight is to inhale and breathe and try to expand that tightness. And I often feel that trying to operate an organization with the gift, it brings me there. It brings me to that space where I'm feeling a little tightness and I, and I choose to breathe and I choose to invite in that generosity. So thank you and I look forward to, uh, to learn from all of you as well. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, uh, yeah, for speaking to the edge. I, I was just, as you were speaking, I was thinking about uh, like when I'm in yoga class and sometimes I'm in a position where like it's really stretching my body and I'm really on the edge and I'm uncomfortable. And then the teacher's like, okay, now relax in this position for a minute. And I'm like, I can't even breathe in this position. I don't know how I'm supposed to relax, but that's the practice, right? Is to try to breathe through those stretches and through that edge. So yeah, thank you for, for bringing that in. Um, so we have uh, one more uh, speaker and then we'll kind of have a discussion amongst the three panelists. Uh, and then after that, we're gonna have a small, a brief moment in small groups again, just to generate some questions. And then we'll come back um, with questions from the participants. Uh, but the next speaker, just for full transparency, is also my partner and is sitting right <laughs> next to me. Uh, they'll, they'll have their own screen as well. Um, but the, the next speaker is Lee Tsen, who uh, has not only taught me about what it means to be in a generous and reciprocal relationship, of course, but um, has taught me a lot of wisdom from all different angles um, about life and about growth and, and um, definitely about uh, the gift. It's been awesome to, to, to watch the Lead Sense practice kind of develop uh, with, with the gift and seeing the, the challenges and the benefits of it and seeing it really work and, and come to fruition, you know. 
Um, and also just, yeah, how much we can learn from the stars and how generous the stars are in terms of their wisdom and how, you know, they give their wisdom without um, requiring anything in return. And I think it's, a, it's another great example of how the natural systems are a, a gifting system. And so, yeah, looking forward to hearing from, from Li Tsen. Um, let me highlight you. All right. Okay, hi folks. So I'm Li Tsen and um, as Kazu mentioned, I'm an astrologer. And so my gift economy practice is very much a private practice also. And I, you know, I've always, when I first started doing astrology and offering it as a practice for folks, I always did it by donation, um, largely because the folks I've always worked with are BIPOC folks, artists, underemployed folks, disabled folks. I've always wanted to make this accessible especially when I think a lot of wellness practices under capitalism are not that accessible. But I came to understand that by donation is different than the gift economy. And I really got introduced into the much deeper world of gift economy through my kind, gentle, visionary partner, Kazu, who's next to me over here. Um, and it really makes sense to me that I, that I got to deepen in this particular practice of the gift economy through relationship because for me, the practice of being in the gift economy is very much about being in relationship, like leaving behind the transactional quality of relationship and actually getting to think about how do we take care of each other with just who we are, what we have. Um, so, you know, because I'm not an organization and I just work for myself, making the switch to the gift economy has required a lot of, um, as Praniti mentioned, inner work. And it's been a really personal journey in that, I don't know if anyone else here resonates with this, but for many years, um, maybe for almost all of my life, I had kind of had this fear of being able to make it in the world. Like being able to survive on a basic level. Capitalism has always felt harsh. I've always been kind of, a, I just have always felt a little afraid that I couldn't do it on my own. So even as I practiced astrology for years, I always had another job or a part-time job. I did astrology on the side. And at some point, I just really wanted to make the dive into believing that actually my existence belongs here because it is here. Like it already is here. And I wanted to be able to trust more fully in that, you know, instead of um, living in fear. So I made a dive into the gift economy after many long late night conversations with Kazu about what it could look like and not having any models before me about how people do it as private individuals in practice, you know? And yeah, and you know, I think at the exact same time that I made this dive, I had also started to learn how to farm. So I was like, getting my hands in the soil and I was also farming as a way to take care of myself and community. And one of the first things I planted, cause I was in Asia, I still am was lettuce, because lettuce is like such a novelty here. People are like, oh, you eat raw greens? <laughs> so I planted lettuce because people were, really were into lettuce. And, you know, I like, I made the soil blend for the seedlings, et cetera. I watered them every day. Um, and four months later, the lettuce stalks, I say stalks because they had become as tall as me. Wow. They were past just the leafing phase. They were, they were this tall, I'm five, two and a half. And um, I had like 10 or 20 of these stalks and the stalks started to explode in yellow flowers. Like one lettuce stalk had so many flowers. And then two weeks later, the flowers had turned into seed pods. And I realized that each lettuce stalk had, I don't know, probably when I harvested the seeds, probably 200 seeds in each stalk. But I had 10 or 20 stalks. So I had like thousands of seeds. And it was such a moment of revelation for me like of just how generous nature is, you know, and that the gift economy, the gift ecosystem was first practiced by nature. Like it's always been here, you know, and um, I, had, I had more seeds that I know to do it. And I, I was just really tickled because I realized that that's how the gift economy works. You know, it's like, I have a gift I want to share, but I need to be cared for and watered every day in order to be able to keep reproducing that gift. 
And the thing that feels different to me about by donation versus the gift economy is that there's that transparency piece that you know folks have been talking about already. It's like, I've learned to have to be really transparent about here are my needs. Would you like to help take care of them? It's like the lettuce is very clear. When I didn't water the lettuce one day, you know, she would get all wilty and sad. It was very, very clear. These are my needs. I need to be taken care of. Um, and this practice has also taught me to do more of that, you know, just to name. And I try to name as transparently as I can on my website for one-on-one -on -one work I do, for all the workshops that I do. And I just try to say like, these are my needs for the year. This is what it looks like. And what I love about that is that it also invites people into a conversation with me. You know, it's not, it's not just this like sliding scale that you can decide where to come in at, but we actually have more of a conversation about what does this look like? Um, yeah, so I think this has been some of my personal journey with it. And then I guess I'll just share that one of the ways that I use the gift economy in my work, aside from, you know, what I've already said is that because working in this way has helped cultivate my gifts that I want to offer the world, I try to do this also in my astrology practice with folks. So when I teach classes and courses and workshops, something I started doing a couple of years ago is this thing called Secret Sunshine. Has anyone ever played Secret Angel, Secret Sunshine? Okay, so it's this little game. It's this anonymous game. <clears throat> and I send out the spreadsheet to everybody before at the first day of the course and people fill out like gifts that they have to offer in one column. And then the other column, they share gifts that they need or things that they need sustenance around from community. And then behind the scenes, I secretly assign each person to somebody. Or actually, Kazu does it because <laughs> Kazu is my executive secret sunshine assistant. So every class, he helps me do the pairings. <laughs> and so everyone's assigned to somebody. And their job is not to be the one to make the gift but their job was to check out the whole cohort and see the whole like rainbow offering of gifts that people are offering and then try to help uh, solicit or ask for some gifts for their person. And so that everyone's giving to each other throughout the three month course, you know? And I don't even have to say anything, but people are always like, oh my goodness, this is the gift economy. This is how it works. Um, so that's one of my favorite ways that we use it in practice too. Yeah, I think I've been talking for a while, so I'm going to pause here. Thank you so much. Um, just see. And we're actually going to be at the end of the, the panel here um, practicing something like the secret uh, angel, secret sunshine, um, with everyone on the call. So definitely make sure to stick around for that. And we just want to um, have a little bit more discussion with the panelists. Uh, and then I think I might keep this discussion a little bit shorter just so we can have more time to hear from the participants as well. Um, and then we'll have an open discussion with any questions, uh, reflections from the conversation. And then we'll close with uh, that, that generosity practice with the secret sunshine-ish type of thing. Um, but yeah, I wanted to ask the three of you and maybe I'll just uh, put all three of you on spotlight here. Um, I wanted to kind of follow up on something that Pranivi was talking about because, you know, the gift economy, I think, as it plays out in our natural ecology is complete and perfect, right? Like the, the, the lettuce plants that Lisa was talking about. And yet we live in a capitalist system. And so when those two things come to a head, um, I know in my own experience, there's been some challenges with that. And it's presented a lot of questions that I still am grappling with, um, just some, some stuff around the gift economy and how it works. And yeah, just curious to hear what challenges you've experienced in the gift economy. What questions are you still grappling with? Um, are there any creative ways that you've gotten through the challenges? Yeah, let's just, like you said, Pranini, not romanticize things, but let's get real about the fact that this is an experiment and there, there's still questions. Um, I really resonated with uh, with what you shared, Litsen, about the transparency. Actually, Cassandra, as well, it seems like that transparency transparency is a really key element to making the gift economy work. Um, I was just reminded that during the pandemic, um, I really had to up my transparency game. Uh, and because actually our lease was up, our five-year lease was up during the pandemic. And so I had, we had to make this decision about do we keep the space or do we not? And I had a sense of what I thought, you know, I might want to do, but I was like, wait a minute, 
this isn't just me, right? This is a community. And so I actually convened a sort of like informal board of our most dedicated students. And I got everybody on a Zoom call and, and I was transparent about the situation, you know? And um, one of the things that came out of that call was, hey, we need to be there's transparent with every student at, that's a part of the shala. So I actually wrote up um, five years of our expenses and our revenue and everything and I also included my child care costs on that spreadsheet which felt really scary to do I think that people who aren't parents may not realize how much child care costs um uh and yeah so and then I sent that out to everybody and I said hey like you know look look at where we were going and then the pandemic happened <laughs> look where we are now you know um and not in a sort of like hey can you give me more money way but hey, like this is the reality of, of what we're doing and I'd like to continue. And so can we make it work as a community? Um, and we're, we're still working on it, uh, but we're still here too. So, yeah. I could share a little bit because I actually started transitioning fully in, like, to this being my full-time way of living and being with people and working probably about seven months before the pandemic. So I was pretty new to it when the pandemic happened and you know, it was pretty easy for me to transition online. So I think for me, what are some of the challenges is just that there's such a gravity and inertia already around, I think just the way that we're used to having transactional like fee for service relationships. And I'm constantly trying to break out of it more with people. Um, but I think that even with what I do, it can sometimes look like, okay, there's an optional fee for service relationship here. And I think I'm still asking myself a lot about how, like now that I'm a few years into operating this way, like what's the next level and to which I can take this? You know, I think this is like has to be an ongoing experience because it's something emergent and experimental that we're doing. Um, yeah, I think so. Honestly, for me, the challenge is, is how do I in the way that we relate to each other, continue to push that boundary. I think some of the boundaries I have to push against is the professional, the professionalization of some wellness work and of our roles to each other. Cause I want to find a way to deepen more even in the relationships we build to each other rather than just have it be so strictly, I don't know, contractual transactional. Like I'm the practitioner, you're the recipient and here's like how we exchange. Um, so yeah, those are some things I've been noodling about, but what are ways to break out of the box even more? Thanks for that. It's interesting to hear y'all talk about it as you know individual practitioners and the this question about transparency and need. And I mean, that's certainly a piece of what is built into the way that we think about and practice gift economics at EBMC. And I mean, there is also this edge, I mean, and, and sort of like speaking to, um, you know, Praniti's um, charge earlier to like speak to the edges is um, just thinking about, and I mean, cause this is sort of in your prompt, but thinking about the way that capitalism functions. And I mean, it's like, because, because we do live within racial capitalism, and speaking from the perspective as the development director at EBMC, the ask for us does need to be for money. Like at EBMC, our ability to survive and thrive and continue to offer the programs does in part depend on money. And we need people to offer their labor and time and talents as well. And we also need money. And it seems like one way of challenging capitalism while living within it is to reframe how we think about and talk about money, like as a, a tool that we're using to do the work that we wanna do to make the world that we wanna make. Um, and as a resource that flows through and that we don't necessarily have to live um, in an antagonistic relationship to it, like to the system of which it's a part, you know, sure. Um, and I don't know, I think, part of um, what I think maybe helps make that shift is allowing, and I think this is what we've been speaking to, but allowing the person who's giving it to place the value on it. Like if the gift is a meaningful gift to them in proportion to what they have available to give at any 
given time, then that makes it a meaningful gift. So we're not placing a value on the amount, like we don't wanna replicate the hierarchies that are a feature of capitalism. Um, yeah, I, yeah, just that, I guess. I mean, I, I feel like I'm constantly wrestling with it because, um, because of those questions of abundance and scarcity. And I mean, the scarcity is baked into capitalism, right? And so like, how do we function within it push against it, you know, shift the frame around it, but also get what we need. And part of it does seem like it's like, it's naming the need. It's like being clear about what we need and, and, and really thinking about what it means. Like, what do we need versus like what, what's grasping or what's acquisitive, you know? Um, and that's like part of Buddhist practice, right? Is to try to figure that out. Um, but then to, to like, um, boldly step into asking for it too, expressing what the need is um, and not feeling, um, yeah, some, um, I don't know what, like shame or resistance or something um, in that. Yeah, I think, you know, even as we play with money, being transparent about our financial needs <clears throat> is certainly not a value that I learned from capitalism. Right? And so I think that that's part of it is, is breaking that kind of taboo of talking about what our needs are. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe just one more question from me before we break into small groups and hear from the rest of the folks here. But um, I was just talking about this with Lee before we jumped on. This wasn't like by uh, intentional planning. It kind of happened that all three of you come from more traditional sources of wisdom, right? Whether it's Buddhism or yoga or astrology. And I'm wondering if in any way you draw influences about the gift from those traditions and if they've influenced your practice in any way. I could say one, I could share one example of that. Um, it hadn't occurred to me actually that we had this connection and that I'm working in the gift economy while practicing a spiritual tradition because uh, it's not that explicitly written into astrology, for instance. Mm -hmm. But the thing that astrology does, and also I'm also a Buddhist practitioner, and I think that what all of these traditions give me is a much larger perspective. Like it takes my narrow personal, like this is my subjective experience. and gives me like a much wider view, uh, even of time. Mm -hmm. Like this, I'm always looking at these long, large cycles of time. Like I did this um, astrology abolition project and I was looking at 250 year cycles. That some things don't come around into, until 250 years later. And I think the gift economy is like that. To me, it's part of why I think of it as not fee for service. It's not like I did a reading or ca taught a class today. So can you pay me today? You know, it's like, it's like being in a longer, larger cycle with one another of caretaking and giving and returning. And something that occurred to me is just earlier in 2021, Kazu and I were invited to go live in this community, uh, this like intentional community. And they helped us, we collectively co-bought the home. But Kaz and I had a lot of conversations about how do we not just be perpetuating um, a cycle of being settlers on indigenous land. So we're still trying to figure it out, but I really wanted to think about how can this become a slow rematriation process where I get to live here, but then return it eventually. And so when we left for Taiwan, it was like, oh, well, why don't we just give it to Let's, why don't we give it to Segura Tay, which is an organization in the Bay Area led by an Ohlone leader who's the indigenous, indigenous people of the land. Um, and just give it over to, that, to them to use, you know, as like one piece of that right now. And so it's been in, it's been in their use in their stewardship right now. And um, then many months later, kind of unbe unexpectedly and not planned for, we also have see this huge donation to help us pay off the house, you know? So it's like, I think part of how gift economy works to me is like we, we, we give without expectation of return, but in the longer cycles of time, there's always some kind of return because that's what relationship is. It's like, we are in this long conversation with each other. You know, I'll just say briefly in terms of, um, you know, Buddhist practice um, and the East Bay Meditation Center. I mean, like I mentioned, you know, generosity being the the first teaching of the Buddha and the 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 first step on the eightfold path to enlightenment, 
Um, and um, also that the, the, um, the way that um, Buddhist teachers think about the teachings is that the teachings of the Buddha are priceless. So there isn't a way to put a price on those offerings. And so they're freely given and the community then supports the teachers um, by you know, meeting their, their needs, um, daily needs. Um, and so really for us, it's, it's almost like there could not be any other structure than a gift economic structure to be in alignment with those, with those values and with the sort of like origins of the spiritual practice. Um, and it's just, a, yeah, it's like figuring out. So like, how do we do that within capitalism, within racial capitalism? Um, Kazu, when I was, as I find myself reflecting on your prompt, of course, the practice of yoga, I feel like it, um, what it invites is a quality of presence that I feel is really essential to be able to know where one's edge is. And like you said, leads on to know what we need to feel nourished, like what we actually need, we have to be able to be present. And that's what yoga calls in. Mm -hmm. um, and I find myself also reflecting on the practice of motherhood and the practice of family life and how, um, how that um, simultaneously teaches me what generosity really is. Like when I'm parenting my child, right? Like there's not much that's transactional about that relationship. It automatically presents us with this much longer time horizon, like you were saying, Lutzen, right? We, we invest these moments when our child is a baby simply for their well being, even though we know that consciously that baby is not going to remember much. But subconsciously, somewhere, like right, there's a feeling of safety and wholeness that's being in, you know, being ingrained in that in that person's sense of self. And so we we invest these things um, simply because we love them. And how beautiful it would be if we were able to offer of ourselves in that way, you know, to everybody to to be able to witness that child within every relationship that we have, every person that we meet. And at the same time, you know, being a mother is very taxing. <laughs> so how can we be really honest about our own needs? How can we make sure that we're getting enough sleep, enough food? Like these are the basic things that we need to be able to take care of other people. We need to be able to take care of ourselves in order to take care of our families and our communities. Uh, so that's just something that I'm, I, I was inspired to share after, after uh, your prompt, Kazu, and, you know, it just really, sh it, this whole conversation is uh, reminding me that the gift economy is not something we practice in specific spheres of our life. It, it, it just sort of, it flows. So once you start practicing it in one area or noticing it in one area, um, you know, it, it can, it can really ripple out. Thank you all so much for that wisdom. Um, and I want to turn it over to everyone else. And before we do that, uh, I just want to give everyone just a few small minutes in some small groups, just to reflect on what you heard, just to generate some more discussion, some more questions, some more prompts. And so you'll have just a, a few small minutes, about six minutes, um, just to talk about what did you hear? And what do you want to hear more of? Do you have any questions? Um, and if you want to get into some discussions about in what ways you might be living into the gift already in your own life and in what ways you want to challenge yourself, I um, definitely want to encourage you to do that too. But um, because I want more of the discussion, um, it won't be a whole lot of time in small groups. Um, so again, you'll have about six, seven minutes in small groups, um, and then we'll be back and we'll continue this discussion with everyone. All right, let's open it up and see if you have questions, reflections um, for the panelists. Yep, I see a hand from, uh, is it Ashley? It is. Thank you. Apologies for my camera not being on. Um, my internet's a little wonky and it's helpful with my camera off. Um, thank you, everyone in the panel. I really appreciate hearing from you all. Um, and so the what's sitting with me a lot is the transparency value and part of it. And 
noticing like what's happening in my body around just thinking through transparency and um you know like the the expectation of transparency from myself as well as for those that I'm trying to be in a relationship with in this gift economy, right? Like how to, because uh, I think the at the workshop you talked about, you know, having even a talking circle that clearly talks about transparency. So um, that went right along with the edge. And so I'm just curious if there's um, ways in which, additional ways in which y'all approach um, or I don't know if it's approach, but like, how do you feel into that work and how do you bring it forward and um, thoughts on that and apologies for the lack of clarity, but it's just kind of swirling at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, you Ashney. Yeah, who wants to take that on? Yeah, what I heard is, you know, there's just a, a um, like I was saying, like there's a, 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 we don't live in a culture that um, teaches us to practice transparency, particularly in terms of needs. And if you ask for what you need, it's almost like something is wrong with you. Like, why can't you take care of yourself, right? So what are practices that we can do to kind of help build those, those muscles and know that it's actually um, a, a necessary component of this reciprocal system to be transparent? Well, at the first thing that's coming to me is something that I think one of us um, spoke about. It's sort of just like finding the, that discomfort, you know, for me, I know I felt it when, um, when I was uh, preparing our five-year report, for example, I, I was like, well, during these five years, I've had a baby. And since I've had the baby, um, part of my need is I need a childcare cost to be covered while I'm teaching. And I was like, what, do I include that on the spreadsheet? I had like this moment of, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's part of, but then I was like, but that's my life. Like that is the reality of my life. And it felt really uncomfortable to include it. And somehow that, I feel like that discomfort is, is, is a marker that probably I should, you know, like it felt like to me, like, because I'm uncomfortable about it, it's probably a good opportunity for me to push against society's norms. Like you were saying, Kasu, like we're not taught to ask for these things. The panelists, we were just talking about, Lisa and Cassandra and I were just talking about how we have these artificially um, delineated portions of our lives, you know, like professional life, personal life, family life, like these little boxes. And so I feel like part of the way I choose to move through the world is to try to blur those lines you know whenever I can and so that was an opportunity for me to when I'm including the childcare costs is to just like blur the line a little bit and to expand expand that edge so for me I think the discomfort is is, is a sign that I'm on the right track <laughs> I felt very similar uh things because when I've put out transparently this is what it needs to run this course you know, I'm the only practitioner really. So I, it's made me ask myself, how much can I share about my, my personal needs, not just the needs to run the organization, but my personal needs as part of it. Um, and I, you know, I guess for me, I would say maybe other people can relate to this or not, but it's really vulnerable to me to be like, these are my needs and, and implicit in that question, like, will you help take care of me? You know, it just feels really vulnerable. So I think a lot of it, this is not as concrete, but it's just required like sort of some meditation practice of like, I'm here with you. Like, I hear that this is hard. I hear that you feel vulnerable and I'm just with you. Just like practicing being with my vulnerable self when I feel that. Um, as I think a, a lot of the practice for me. And I would, the other thing I would say is that the gift economy practice has been as much about transparency as it has been about trust. Like a lot of what I had to do was take a huge leap of faith of like, yeah, the universe wants me to exist. I know this because I do exist. 
um, my existence itself is already proven. So can I trust that the universe will help me continue to exist and take care of my needs? And I think the beautiful thing about making that leap of trust has also felt like I actually can trust other people more too. What I love about doing the gift economy is I'm not counting to see like, has someone paid me? I actually think about that less. Like I just kind of believe in the long cycle of conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so far it's worked. So I think I, I've had to build up my trust practice as much as my transparency practice. I so appreciate the, the, the highlighting the vulnerability and the trust. And I, I one thing that um, I think is just important to name, like coming from an organ, more from an organizational perspective is that part of transparency for us is also about accountability, like accountability to community and sharing not only what is needed, but also um, how those resources that the community is collectively um, offering is, um, you know, being given back to community. So that accountability piece is, is I think, different in the organizational sphere maybe than in, um, you know, when people are practicing the gift as individuals, but I don't know. Thank you all. Um, I see a few questions. Uh, let's go to Ying Zhao first and then we'll hear from Tracy. Hi, thank you. And thank you for the panelists. Um, one question as, as a follow-up to the transparency piece, which is many things we need are not financial, right? I also have a young child. She's being babysat right now by a show next to me. So like what I need is not so much money because actually getting a babysitter is not straightforward at all. What I need is actually someone to watch her when I work sometimes. When a neighbor offered recently to, um, to do that and I, when I actually asked her this January, she turned it down. It was extremely vulnerable for me. And so I don't quite know even like how to word it, right? Those kinds of asks, that's basically asking of a village. And so that's one question. The other part of the question about transparency is I still, in my journey, I feel like a lot of what I do don't need to make money, but some, I, some needs to, right? That kind of, um, so, so I do some paid work. So in being transparent about what you need, are you also transparent about that portion of your, of your life or your livelihood? And those are my questions, thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to comment real, um, really quickly on um, the idea of asking for what you need. Um, when we're working with consultants, both in grant writing and fundraising, um, they tell us, don't, don't tell the donor that you need to pay your staff. They don't wanna know about that. They want. They want to know what you're doing for the community. And it's like, it's really disingenuous and it's not who we are. Like we want to tell people, look, we're black and brown people and we want to pay our folks a living wage, um, I mean, a thriving wage, not just enough to get by. And we're in a city that is incredibly expensive and we're trying to provide services to heal community. And so there's, there's like a sense of patriarchy about healing work being feminine and therefore we don't need as much money. And, and so there's just like a whole bunch of stuff going on around our fundraising. And so we have to push back a little bit and say, no, we're going to go ahead and say, we, we want to pay our people and provide funding to community wellness folks who tend not to make um, very much money. We want to pay them a, a, a lot <laughs> for the work that they do because it's stressful working to support other people through their trauma and um, heal their trauma is stressful work and we want to be able to let our folks have wellness days and a professional development and we have a lot of dreams about what we want to do um, but we don't have enough money to do it and so then it's like, okay, so if we use gift economy and no one's paying for the classes, like where's, how do we, you know, balance that? So then you have to have other revenue coming in so that you can actually pay your folks. So it's, it's just the whole setup sucks and it just, um, it makes it really difficult. And I really feel like this moment of, of um, <clears throat> funders saying, 
we want to have a relationship with you is fleeting. I, I think it's BS. I don't think it's going to stay around. There'll be maybe a handful of folks who coming out of um, all the pain and trauma that we've gone through since before, during and after George Floyd will be like, oh, yeah, we're really going to change the way we're going to do things. But it's not enough of the majority of the philanthropic world for it to make a dent for all the black and brown organizations actually doing the work on the ground. So it's that makes moving to a gift economy. Well, we already are a gift economy, um, but building it out, it makes it more stressful. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I want to just I want to speak to something that I heard from both of you, um, Tracy and Ying Xiao. Like, um, I think there's a tendency when we do this time uh, type of work to let perfectionism sort of bleed into it and and feel shame about um, not being perfectly gift economy. Like like Ying Xiao said, like having to take some more traditional jobs here and there or take funding from a source that isn't totally ideal or whatever like just I think we really need to be careful about the perfectionism because it doesn't really serve any I found in my life I should just speak from my own experience that perfectionism doesn't really serve me doesn't really serve my organization doesn't really serve my family um <laughs> I don't know this is again because I'm like parent to two young children we watched this show called Daniel Tiger I don't know if any of you <laughs> <laughs> like watch it with your kids but all the songs are constantly like replaying in my mind and the one that's coming up is do your best your best is the best for you <laughs> okay so like that's all you can do <laughs> the wisdom in the stories <laughs> of children <laughs> So maybe we'll just try to squeeze in. We just have a minute or two left and a couple of things that we wanna do for closing. One last uh, comment or question from Rebecca and then we'll transition. Hi, um, I'm not sure this is a brief question but I'll throw it out there anyway. Um, I, I love the idea of gift economy and included with transparency, I heard the need somewhere along the line either today or the other day about um, cutting your living expenses down to what is really necessary for me. Um, unfortunately, or maybe it's the way it's supposed to be, but um, my partner, my husband, has a very different value system around money. We have a Corvette, we have several motorcycles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he wants to buy a second home. I want to move into a smaller condo. Um, so we're, we're on equal like this. And then how do I be transparent about my, quote, needs when everyone can see that we have these you know, these luxury items, it's very, very awkward. And I don't see how I can, uh, you know, anyone have any ideas about that? Thank you for that really complex yeah. question. Yeah, any thoughts? It's a tough one. I mean, I, you know, I think um, the transparency that you just showed, showed just now is part of it. Right, just like being real about what your situation is and being transparent about the the struggles that you're having with that, I think is part of it. You know. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you, cousin. Yeah. Any other thoughts from any of the two of you all? Um, I I don't have any answers, but I I just the question I find myself asking is I wonder um, what opening this could bring about in your relationship with your husband. I wonder if there is an opportunity for some kind of deeper connection or growth in your relationship just by just by having these questions, you know, live in, in the context of, of your relationship. Double click on that. And um, I also have no answers, but I can just share that I think like my needs assessment is an ongoing practice that I get to practice because I work in the gift economy of asking myself, what are my needs? You know, like, what are they really? Um, in addition to my income, do I have help from anyone in my family? Um, do I have help because I live in a shared community, right? And, and balancing, and I don't know, you know, what the ins and outs of your shared finances are with your partner, cause I don't share all of our finances. Um, so I do have some needs separate from our relationship, right? And and I think it's, to me, it's like, 
it's part of my work to learn how to just name what mine are and be able to share like you did so transparently what my situation is. Um, but someone also put in the chat the question of like basic needs versus like needs for comfort. And that is part of how I assess my personal needs too. Is like, I really want to live in a world where we all get to like more than just scrape by. I, I used to, um, this is a funny example, but like Huey P. Nguyen used to talk about how he wanted to live in a world where everyone could wear silk shirts. I don't, that's not my version of that world. It's not that we all have to wear silk shirts, but I want us to do more than like just have the most basic bare needs met. And so I do include that in thinking about my needs assessment. Like how can I be thriving? Not like zoned out to the needs of the rest of the world, but you know, a balance there. I want to honor everyone's time and just uh, have a couple of quick things before we close. Um, so, you know, lots of uh, no answers, but just deepening into the discussion even more. And so to continue the discussion and the relationship, I'm just going to put a few links into the chat right now. Um, if you want to follow up with these, uh, the, the three panelists, you can find out more about each of their work um, by clicking on the links below. I also mentioned in the, um, the email leading into this panel, as well as uh, at, at the beginning of the panel, we're practicing a new thing. Um, if you click on that link that I just put in, you'll be taken to a brief survey where if you have a gift that you want to offer to this particular community or a request that you want to uh, make to this community, um, you can fill that in. And it can be something as simple as I want to share my favorite poem with somebody over email or something much more concrete, like I would like to offer a, a, an hour of a counseling session if you're a counselor, or I'm a photographer and can take your headshot for uh, free, or um, I'll take you on a walk if we live in the same area, anything you want. Um, or if you have a need, right, like, please send prayers my way, or I'm actually in financial need, please send uh, some, some, some uh, gifts to this PayPal if you can. And this is something that I'm not going to track at all. But in a week or two, once this populates, I'll send the results to everyone that's uh, both on this panel as well as was in the workshop earlier this week. And it'll just be up to you all to follow up with each other. And we'll just see what the universe does in terms of creating um, this, this uh, ecosystem of gift gifting. Um, and finally, uh, this one last link. If you would like to support um, the East Point Peace Academy for our work moving forward, as well as the three panelists, please, um, if you uh, just feel like it would give you joy to, to, to give, please follow this link specifically, eastpointpeace.org backslash GEP donate, that's gift economy panel donate, so GEP donate, so we can track that. Um, and all of the income that is given through that link will be shared with the three panelists. Um, none of the three came on here expecting a payment or asked for a payment. And at the same time, we want to make sure that their time is honored. And so both of those things are very real. And so um, if you can, please do give generously and we'll make sure that that is shared. Um, and yeah, so I just want to thank the three of you again, Cassandra, Leedsen, and Perniti, <clears throat> as well as all of you for showing up on the panel. Um, you know, I really have enjoyed this discussion and the conversation earlier in the week. So as I shared, we might keep this going um, and make this panel a regular thing. There's many practitioners of the gift all over the world, including some more on this call that I would love to hear their wisdom. Um, so please be on the lookout on East Point's site. Um, and I feel like there was one more thing, but I can't remember. So maybe I'll send it in the follow-up email. But um, thank you all again. Um, and so I invite uh, everyone to just come off of mute briefly, just to shower these panelists with your gratitude and we'll end with that. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you very so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank many, many thanks. Much. Thank, thank, you you so thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you. So we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.